Good morning, everyone. All right. I invite you to have your Bibles out. This one's going to be a bit of a page turner. I was told that I the only constraint on what I could say up here is that I had to be done by 10 a.m. for classes to start. So uh, hopefully uh, that'll work out, and we'll probably even have a few minutes to spare. So we'll see how that goes. Um, the I gave an invitation uh, a couple weeks back. Uh, and this morning's uh, lesson exhortation is essentially an extended version of that. Where's my clicker pull? Uh, that invitation was a few days ago, or sorry, it was a few days after the assassination attempt. And thinking back to that event, uh, it got me thinking about how the so-called political climate in our country got, you know, so hot. Uh, you know, what is it that you know elevated that temperature? And certainly. Um, most people would agree that we are in one of the hottest political climates, certainly at least of my lifetime. Uh, some would say since the civil rights Vietnam era of the late 60s, early 70s. Some would even go farther back than that. And one of the reasons, and certainly one of the symptoms at least, is the language that we use on all sides. Uh, it's not good language. It's hateful, it's divisive, it's inflammatory, inciting. Uh, and that speech is propped up and given a platform by the traditional media, by social media, where it's uh, amplified. The world wants us to feel angry and bitter, um, partly because that drives engagement, which then drives more rhetoric, and it's just a vicious cycle um, that's very unfortunate. And so the focus of that invitation and now of uh, this morning's sermon is kind of how we as Christians, how we are to respond to the world around us uh, when it comes to the things we say to the language that we use. Uh, there are dozens of verses throughout the Bible that talk about the power of words and how we are to speak as Christians. We'll look at some of those throughout this lesson, and you're probably thinking of some now. Um, but I really want to go a step further than that. And in the, the style of the you know, classic four-point sermon, I want to look at four things. I want to look at four things, uh, four reasons why our words matter, the things, why the things that we say out loud matter. And the first reason that they matter uh, is that they, those words influence ourselves. And what exactly do I mean by that? Um, so if you have your Bible out, go ahead and turn to James chapter 3. We'll be reading from that in just a moment. And by the way, my Bible headlines this section as the tongue is a fire, and we're going to see why that's the case. Uh, in these verses. Uh, the book of James is probably one of the best books, um, especially in the New Testament, in terms of you know, everyday Christianity or applied Christianity, Christianity. Sort of that, you know, I have this faith, I have this hope, but I'm not really sure how that's acted out in my day-to-day -day life. Like, what does it actually mean in my everyday life to be a Christian? How should that be reflected? James, for example, uh, is where we learn that we should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. That's James 1, verse 19. In James chapter 1, uh, verse 26, we see why controlling our tongues is so important. And here, and for the rest of these slides, I'll be reading from the Amplified Translation. If anyone thinks himself to be religious and does not control his tongue but deludes his own heart, that person's religion is worthless. So James elaborates this on this in chapter 3. Uh, so let's look at verses two through eight. For we all stumble and sin in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to bridle his whole body and rein in his entire nature. Now, if we put bits into horses' mouths to make them obey us, we guide their whole body as well. And look at the ships. Even though they are so large and driven by strong winds, they are still directed by a very small rudder wherever the impulse of the helmsman determines. And let's pause right there for a second. Uh, to emphasize this point, and okay, I'll admit I'm also a nerd, um, I want to visualize exactly what James is saying here. Uh, so this is a ship, right? Looks like a ship. A uh, huge piece of mass. Uh, it's mostly structural. It's mostly static. The only thing that is determining whether the ship makes it to port or not is this little rudder down here at the end. And this applies to other forms of modern transportation, too. You might think of the steering wheel on your car. Uh, or you might think of these guys that we see flying a lot around uh, next to the Air Force Base. This is a C-17. The thing that determines whether the C-17 makes it onto the runway or not 
are these various control surfaces, the ailerons, and well, this is a sermon, not a technical talk, but you know, these little, uh, little bits on the airplane, relatively small. Uh, another comparison, a rocket. The only thing that's determining whether this rocket makes it to orbit or not is the slight gimbling of the engines or the movement of the engines right here at the bottom. Now, sure, there's a lot of power there too that's helping it get to orbit, but that power has to be oriented in the right direction. And in this analogy, we're talking about moving in a direction. I'm going to get to that in a little bit. Uh, but for now, the kind of the, the metaphor is that, you know, our tongue is the one thing that we have to control about ourselves. It's uh, the thing that steers us either in the right direction or the wrong direction. So let's keep reading in James chapter 3, picking up at verse 5. In the same sense, the tongue is a small part of the body, and yet it boasts of great things. See how great a forest is set on fire by a small spark. Uh, by the way, let's pray for our friends in Colorado and California who are experiencing that forest fire analogy firsthand. Continuing in verse 6, And the tongue is a fire, the very world of injustice and unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members as that which contaminates the entire body and sets on fire the course of our life and is itself set on fire by hell. For every species of beasts and birds, of reptiles and sea creatures, is tamed and has been tamed by the human race. But no one can tame the human tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. We'll come back to this chapter in the next few verses in a minute. But when speaking about ourselves, we see that the tongue is the most important thing for us to control. One of the main themes of the Bible is self-control and of submission. We're either controlling ourselves and yielding submission to God and his precepts and his word, or we are releasing that control to the world and giving in to our desires, hedonistic desires, and to sin. If we can control things like our lust and our pride and our apathy and our laziness and our greed and our jealousy, that's great. But can we control our tongues or do our tongues control us? Turn with me now. Uh, the next section will be uh, Matthew chapter 15. I mentioned this will be a page turner, right? Uh, in Matthew chapter 15, uh, we'll see Jesus himself address the subject of words. Here in Matthew chapter 15, Jesus is addressing the Pharisees uh, who just accused the disciples of violating their traditions and religious laws. Let's start in verse 7. Again, Jesus speaking. You hypocrites, rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you when he said, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. But in vain do they worship me, for they teach as doctrines the precepts of men. Those verses, by the way, the Lord is quoting Isaiah chapter 29, verse 13. Continuing here in Matthew, after Jesus called the crowd to him, he said, listen and understand this. It is not what goes into the mouth of a man that defiles and dishonors him, but what comes out of the mouth that defiles and dishonors him. Jesus goes on to explain that our words are an extension of our heart, and the impurities of our hearts will come out as words. And it's not just for our own sakes that we should watch our words and our hearts. Clearly, the Lord also cares about what we say. Uh, so now going back a few chapters to Matthew chapter 12, we'll see that our words are in fact part of our judgment. This, these verses will sound similar uh, to the verses in Matthew chapter 15 uh, that we just read. Here, kind of a similar setup. Jesus has just cast out a demon from a man, and the Pharisees, again, challenging Jesus and his disciples, saying that Jesus was doing these things by the power of Satan. The Lord is quick to rebuke them. We learn of the one unforgivable sin. And Jesus continues, starting in verse 33, either make the tree good, either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For the tree is recognized and judged by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you speak good things when you are evil? For the mouth speaks out that, that which fills the heart, the good man from his good treasure brings out good things, and the evil man from his evil treasure brings out evil things. So far, this is congruent with the other previous readings from Matthew and James, but pay attention to the next two verses. Again, Jesus still speaking. But I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will have to give an accounting for every careless or useless word they speak. 
For by your words, you will be justified and acquitted of the guilt of sin. And by your words, you will be condemned and sentenced. Remember what I said about heading for a destination? Our souls are going somewhere. Our words are a reflection of our spiritual condition. By disciplining our words, we discipline our hearts. And if we fail to do so, that will also be present in our fruits to our peril. This is also spoken of in Proverbs chapter 18, verse 21. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love and indulge it will eat its fruit and bear the consequences of their words. Next, our words matter to other people. Sometimes when I talk, you know, I'm just talking to myself, but generally when I'm talking, I'm talking to other people. Uh, staying in Proverbs chapter 12, verse 6 reads, The words of the wicked lie in wait for blood, but the mouth of the upright will rescue and protect them. Now let's flip back over to James chapter 3. We'll resume those uh, verses that we left off in chapter 3. We're going to pick up in verse 10 and look at verses 10 through 12. Out of the same mouth come blessing and cursing. These things, my brothers, should not be this way. Does a seed send out from the same opening, or sorry, does a spring send out from the same opening both fresh and bitter water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, produce olives, or a grapevine produce figs? Nor can salt water produce fresh. In other words, we have a moral obligation to speak in a manner that reflects our fear of God and reflects our fear and respect of his precepts. And other people will see it. Uh, other people will see what we say, for better or for worse. Between blessings and curses, we should choose blessings. We see a classic verse about speech, Ephesians 4.29, which reads, Do not let any unwholesome words ever come out of your mouth, but only such speech is as good for building up others, according to the need and the occasion, so that it will be a blessing to those who hear. Other translations uh, translate that last part as, that it may give grace to those who hear, or that it may benefit those who listen. Just as our faith should produce good works for those of us around us, we see that a lot in James chapter 2, our faith should also produce good words that build up others and show that love to others. Before I met Julia, uh, I had some relationships where I learned the power of words uh, firsthand, the hard way. For example, if my at the time girlfriend asked me, how does this dress look? I knew that my next words, to borrow some language from uh, Proverbs chapter 15, verse 4, would either be the soothing tongue, that's the tree of life, or it would be the perverse tongue that crushes the spirit. Um, and you learn very quickly the effect that your words have on others. And in some cases, the best thing to say really is nothing at all. An example of what we should not say can be found in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 23, probably one of my favorite verses um, in 2 Timothy, which reads, but have nothing to do with foolish and ignorant speculations, since you know that they produce strife and give birth to quarrels. If I didn't know any better, uh, I'd think Paul was browsing Facebook when he wrote that. Finally, what was true 2,000 years ago is still true today, but the gospel message is primarily a spoken gospel. Um, these days we have the luxury of reading the Bible, all the word is compiled here, uh, and some people come to faith just by picking up a Bible and starting to read it, but usually it starts with a conversation with someone else, something that is heard and is spoken. I didn't become a believer by reading a pamphlet or just magically discovering the Bible and started reading it. I was invited to an event, and at that event, someone verbally told me that God is real, that Jesus loves me, and that he wanted to save me from my sins. It was a spoken gospel that was delivered and it was a spoken confession with which I responded. When Jesus was on the earth, he spread his message by speaking. After the ascension of Jesus, the apostles preached the gospel. Let's turn to a familiar passage, Acts chapter 2, to see an example of this. And I'm going to kind of just give the Cliff Notes version of Acts chapter 2, but uh, pick out a couple specific verses. Uh, so it's the day of Pentecost. The apostles are gathered together, uh, and they are filled with the Holy Spirit, and they begin speaking in all these different tongues. 
Um, and and that, that's in verse four. And it starts attracting quite a crowd. A lot of people are curious about what's happening. Some of them are amazed. Some of them are bewildered. Some of them are accusing them of being drunkards. And uh, <laughs> they're drinking the early morning wine. But then we see in verse 14, Peter, standing with the 11, raised his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all you who live in Jerusalem, let this be explained to you. Listen closely and pay attention to what I have to say. Peter then shares the gospel of Jesus, a man who was attested to those who were there, attested by God, a man who those same men then handed to the Roman authorities to be put to death, and a man who God then rose from the dead. And then in verse 27, now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what are we to do? Through Peter's spoken preaching, 3,000 souls were saved that day. The importance of preaching the gospel is emphasized throughout the New Testament. Now going to Romans chapter 10, we'll see that uh, the word of faith brings about salvation. It's kind of the theme of that chapter. It's going now to Romans chapter 10. And I'll start in verse 12. Verse 12, for there is no distinction between Jew and Gentile, for the same Lord is Lord over all, and abounding in riches for all who call on him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Okay, sounds simple enough. But then we get to verse 14. But how will people call on him whom they have not believed? And how will they hear, sorry, I missed one. And how will they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? And how will they preach unless they are commissioned and sent? Just as it is written and forever remains written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. But they did not all pay attention to the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has received our report? So faith comes from hearing, and what is heard comes by the message concerning Christ. Jesus gives us the commission to go and make disciples by preaching, spreading the word with our words, with our spoken language, the gospel. Speaking the gospel is necessary for others to hear the gospel, which is necessary for others to respond to and be saved by the gospel. How are we to speak concerning the gospel? Ephesians 4.25 tells us to speak truth with our neighbors. And importantly, a few verses before that in verse 16, we're told to speak the truth in love. Well, let's look at Colossians chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. Conduct yourselves with wisdom in your interactions with outsiders, making the most of each opportunity. Let your speech at all times be gracious and pleasant, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer each one. We must be ready to speak about the gospel when asked. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. But in your hearts, set Christ apart as Lord. Always be ready to give a defense to anyone who asks you to account for the hope and confident assurance that is within you, yet with gentleness and respect. As we read these verses, we see that we're to speak with grace, we're to speak with gentleness, with respect. Okay. Um, and and it's, it's kind of easy and kind of tempting to leave it there. Uh, but there's another component that, at least I know for me, is challenging. Uh, maybe for some of us here too, uh, but it's nonetheless very important when we're spreading the gospel message. Let's now turn to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, we're reading of the armor of God, the imagery being that we are soldiers fighting a spiritual battle for Christ. And then in verses 19 and 20, Paul makes this request to the Ephesians and pray for me that the words may be given to me when I open my mouth to proclaim boldly the mystery of the good news for which I am an ambassador in chains. And I pray in proclaiming it that I may speak boldly and courageously as I should. We also see this in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 12. Since we have such a hope and confident expectation, we speak with great courage. Sharing the gospel isn't always an easy experience. Some may respond well, but others may reject the message. 
It can be demoralizing to see so many around us choose the world instead of choosing Christ. But that's not a reason to stop or back down, but rather with boldness, we should continue fighting the fight. And there's a consequence if we don't. Our final passage takes us back once again to Proverbs. This time we're in chapter 24. Let's look at verses 11 and 12. Rescue those who are being taken away to death, and those who stagger to the slaughter, oh, hold them back. If you say, see, we did not know this, does he not consider it who weighs and examines the hearts and their motives? And does he not know it who guards your life and keeps your soul? And will he not repay every man according to his works? By the way, this doesn't just apply to the unsaved. We must always be lifting each other up, saved or unsaved, and reminding ourselves of the gospel. In the book of Revelation, each message to the seven churches contains the same admonition. He who has an ear, let him hear, and heed what the Spirit says to the churches. So as we go into the world, especially into the selection cycle, it's tempting to be hateful, to contaminate our hearts and ill will and have curses towards the other side, or maybe even our own side, or all sides, you know, whichever side, it doesn't really matter. Um, but we should remember to keep all the words that we say, regardless of where they're directed. Our words should be seasoned with salt. It should be a blessing to those around us. And we should share the hope that we carry within us. We're not called to condemn the lost, but to seek and save the lost. And yeah, at this time, uh, I didn't really wrap that up. So uh, we'll go ahead and pray now. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your son and the hope that we have within us. We pray that you will help us keep our words and our hearts pure, that we may be an example to you in our lives, and that we will spread your word with graciousness and boldness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You are now dismissed to your classes.